We have a fantastic interview coming up for you. One of the world's largest asset managers, Franklin Templeton CEO, Jenny Johnson is here. She's going to be interviewed by Julie Hyman of Yahoo News, so, or Yahoo Finance, I should say. Uh, Jenny and Julie, when you're ready, why don't you come on out? I like our entrance music. I do too. I also like this conference that they serve wine and beer before you come in towards the five o'clock. I know. Did you take any? I felt like for you guys, I probably shouldn't. Yeah. We'll have some after. Don't to. worry. Um, so welcome, everybody. Welcome to Jenny. And I'm going to dive right into it and talk about um, the role that you guys have played in ETFs and the ETF business, since that's why everybody's here. Um, Franklin Templeton's first ETF was in 2013. And then you introduced another line, the Liberty Shares lineup, in 2016. Um, and obviously, there were some people who had been in ETFs for a long while before that. So what was then the, the trigger, the, the thing that flipped your switch to get in? And then how did it affect that timing? How did it affect what products you guys decided to offer? Yeah, no. So in 2013, we sort of did it as a fluke. It was a short duration. And it was, you guys may remember back then, the, they were talking about capital requirements on money market funds and things, and we were like, uh, that's going to kill money markets. We should do some other pro Why don't we learn ETFs? And I got to tell you, we did not understand it at the time because we didn't understand that this thing called capital markets function. We just thought you'd kind of launch it like an ETF. So it sort of floated around for a while. And then uh, we realized, wait a second, there's a whole group of advisors that just sell ETFs for a variety of reasons. And while some people said, oh, you're late going to the ETFs, the reality is, and to this day, active ETFs only represent 4%. So we came out immediately um, with, with a passive lineup, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, multi-factor smart beta and active, which were both multi-factor and active, were very new at the time. We were really some of the first moving into that space. And the only reason we did passive is because we think passive is, it's like driving a car with no safety features and barely having brakes, so it should be really cheap. And there, were, um, there was obviously pricing arbitrage. We're 40 to 60 basis points cheaper uh, than the, the other passives out there. And we just said, you know what? Let's just go out there and, and make, pass make beta cheap like it should be. How do you do that? How do you make that work for you? How do you make it make sense for you uh, in terms of the bottom line? Or do you view it as something to, to get people in the door? Well, so we definitely viewed it as something to get people in the door and to show our commitment. Um, to be honest, we've been a little bit surprised that people are willing to pay 40 to 60 basis. We thought, oh, this is going to be a no-brainer. It's, it's, it's passive. Uh, and so it surprised us. We're now finally, years later, getting traction there. Um, but it was, it was a little bit of surprise. But it was really about making sure that the message was we're here to stay in the ETF space. We think it's an important. As an asset manager, we look at our intellectual property as essentially in our capabilities as what our investment teams are able to do. And then we want to be agnostic to the vehicles that we deliver it in. Uh, and so we want to deliver whatever's appropriate for the client. And there's just certain distribution, um, really financial advisors and RAAs and others, and, and some institutions that prefer an ETF as a way to receive that investment capability. And so if your investment strategists are your superpower, so to speak, um, and, and what set you guys apart, where, where are your areas of strength in ETFs right now that you want to see get bigger? Well, I think, I think there's huge opportunity in the, um, in the active space for that to grow. And, mm -hmm. and obviously, fixed income is a, is a big one right now that uh, we're seeing some growth. But I actually think on the equities, uh, you're going to see it as well. Again, it's 4% it's of assets, but it's 12% of flows. So uh, you know, I think that people are starting to recognize we've had 12 years of just massive central bank intervention where money's essentially printed out there and interest rates were zero. Where were you going to put your money? You put it in the equity markets. Equity markets, all boats float up. Uh, and we all know in momentum markets, passive tends to do better. Now introduce an entire uh, rising rates, inflation, supply chain, so demand question, real, you know, you could potentially have stagflation, that's when you need active. Uh, and so we think that it's a real opportunity for active to shine now. So again, to take a step back here, so you're talking about the passive funds that you have that you price lower, 
you've got the active share. I believe the product offerings are still about half and half, if I'm not mistaken. So how do you see the two working together? How, they, how, should, how are they working together for you at Franklin? How should they be working together for an investor? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, there, there's different ways that people use ETFs. So one is you can have a, a um, you know, a multi, uh, multi-asset ETF that people will just say, oh, this will be my income solution. And I, you know, I prefer to receive it and it represents my entire portfolio. Or it can be a model portfolio and it could be a sleeve. Or you can have a very active um, macro investor who says, hey, I want exposure to Brazil right now. Uh, so I want to just get exposure. What's the best ETF to give me exposure? I don't need to pick and choose which stocks in Brazil I have exposure to or say the UK or whatever. And so it just depends on how we want to either be the building blocks or the end solution, depending on whatever the client's needs. And we just want to have optionality for clients. And you mentioned Brazil. You guys do have some strong offerings in um, the various countries. So how do you think about how people should be viewing those right now, especially given, you know, there's a few things going around on around the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's a time where we're all looking at it and saying, well, actually, country investments, I mean, I just, you know, had somebody come to me and say, wow, you know, we talk about Russia and Ukraine. What about China? How do you think about China? Some, some are very positive on it and some are very, very negative on it and with the current lockdowns. So it's, I, again, I think of those as a way to express whatever your conviction is from an investment standpoint. And all you're doing is talking about exposure as opposed to, I, I believe in particularly in emerging markets, we see this active management in equities in emerging markets outperforms. And so, but... If you're just trying to get quick exposure, especially to people who tend to be macro investors and trade in and out, then, a, then a, just a passive quick country port, uh, ETF is a great solution for that. Do you expect most of your growth to continue to come on the active side of the business? So I would like to say, listen, we, we aspire to hit 50 billion in the next three years in ETFs. We're about 13 billion now. I think as we've gotten traction on the passive, that, that th- th- there's gonna be just an, at, at some point when each of these has a certain scale, it's hard to ignore the differential, right? With what the alternative products are. So I actually, and we're seeing that, you're starting to see bigger and bigger tickets there. I do think that there's a possibility that we hit that kind of hockey, hockey point on the passive side where we'll see accelerated growth there um, because it's just kind of a no brainer. But I, I would like to see and I think because I'm, a pa- I'm passionate about active, I think that there's value that is added in active management um, in both fixed income and equity. I would like to see more growth in, in those. Uh, and you know, we've had, we have a couple billion dollar uh, fixed income uh, ETFs. Uh, and I think, you know, in this, like I said, in this environment, I think active is gonna continue to outperform. As you pointed out, though, sometimes there's a differential between the quality of the offering or the price of the offering, in the case of the passive, and the adoption of the offering, right? And so when you're talking about going from $13 billion in assets to $50 billion in assets in the ETFs, how, how do you get there? What's the, I mean, besides talking to folks like this who, you know, you want to look at the stuff, sure. um, what's, what's the plan for the, and the roadmap for how to get there? You know, it's, it's funny, in, uh, in asset management, I'm telling you, like, the investment people probably represent about, I don't know, 8% of the industry, and they actually wonder what the other 92% do. Uh, and, and it, you know, in many ways, it's a lesson for us on distribution, right, which is we made sure we got the investment capabilities right on the ETFs. We assumed you could apply your traditional uh, mutual fund, say, kind of sales force uh, into an ETF, but the reality is the buyers of ETF in many cases are different. And so we've had to go through the process and think, all right, we got to retool and rethink about insuring, because I always say it's, it's kind of 50% of the game, is making sure we are structured from a support and a distribution to be able to support those products. And I'm not sure we did it great initially. I would also, the same thing goes for alternatives. I'm passionate about alternatives ultimately coming into the, to the retail channel. Um, and, but 
you know, it's a, it's a little bit of running with scissors. We're talking about very illiquid asset classes uh, and a risk to the average person who may need their money. So finding the right way to do that and the right investment vehicles as well as strategies is really important. But also what we're learning is having the distribution support to be able to sell those types of products is different than the traditional way that you had to do it. And to be honest, I'm not sure um, that, that everybody has figured it out, uh, particularly on the alternative side. So we're all sort of, right now, I, I, can, I know it, because talking to my peers, there's kind of a mad scramble to figure out how to do this. And, and also talk to me about how it fits into the overall Franklin wrapper and business. Because you know we talked about 13 billion now, $50 billion goal, one and a half trillion is what you guys currently have as your AUM. So how do you think about the importance of ETFs as a growth engine, as a marketing tool for the company, um, and, and the role that it plays? So uh, look, it, as I said, I, I think that our job is to be agnostic to the vehicle and pick the best vehicle for the situation. And the reality is an ETF versus a mutual fund. Listen, why were mutual funds seemingly more expensive? Well, there was a lot of distribution and services fees embedded in a mutual fund that are not embedded in an ETF. ETFs are sold by fee-based advisors in, in kind of the, the, the high net worth space. And so a mutual fund seemed expensive. It was almost like double dipping, right? We, we don't mind having the same investment team do mutual funds as well as ETFs. Our Dynatech has been our big innovation fund. It's a phenomenal fund. Um, but when we launched the ETFs, we did thematic genomics, AI, e-commerce, right? We picked thematic ETFs. But it's the same investment team who provides the research to the mutual fund. Um, so again, it's, yeah, and I think CITs, I mean, Probably uh, collective investment trusts on the retirement side didn't really, they weren't that big 10 years ago. Now they're a huge percentage of that, so it's being flexible. I think tokenization is going to massively uh, impact what types of products can be brought to market and, and what actual investments can be included. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the way I view it at Franklin Templeton is our job is to make sure that we're staying on top of whatever those vehicles are to deliver our capabilities and ensure that they're the best offerings for the client. Um, I wanna come back to tokenization, but just to move off of that for just a second. Um, you guys have done some big acquisitions, um, like Mason was one of the biggest ones, not just for you guys, but for the industry also. You've done some alternatives, you've done them indexing, some other th areas. Um, where do you still see gaps that you want to fill or areas that you want to enhance through maybe making some acquisitions? So we looked at acquisitions um, in kind of three areas. Either it was going to fill sort of product capability, I'll say product capability. It was going to fill a geography. Maybe we had that capability, but we didn't have a geography. Example, we bought Benefit Street Partners, which is a private credit manager. They're a you know, $32 billion US private credit manager. You go to Europe, they don't want to buy US private credit. They want European private credit. You go to Asia, they don't want US, right? So that's, that's filling in a geography of a capability that you have. Um, and then finally, one of the things that Lake Mason uh, did for us is we had been 75% retail. They were 75% institutional. It just diversified your client base. So, you know, filling that in. But I, I feel like we're pretty good there. So it'll usually be capabilities or geographies. And then bring that back to ETFs for me and how um, that then can inform your ETF capabilities. Or would you even be looking to, to buy more product? Well, so uh, take, take Leg Mason. I mean, our, um, it's actually doing really well right now. Our low vol, um, high dividend, right? So it's, I want to be in the equity markets, but I'm going to take a little risk off the table, is a Leg Mason uh, product. So, you know, we, whether it's Clearbridge, Brandywine, Western, or a Martin Curry, you know, they all have ETFs or are in the pipeline to have ETFs. So again, you know, it's taking that capability and saying, what, what is appropriate to deliver through an ETF. And then how do you figure out if that acquisition has worked, right? Or how do you figure out if it's a, measure the success of it um, as you're digesting all of these various buys? You know, w when we did the acquisition, we were, we were trying to fill in certain things um, and, and we achieved those, uh, which was 
uh, certain gaps in our product line. At core, core plus fixed income was a massive gap at the time. It was the largest asset class as far as flows. Uh, we knew we wanted to grow in alternatives. Clarion Partners is unbelievable. I'd put them up against BREIT any day. Um, and, uh, you know, th we, they're a $72 billion uh, um, real estate manager. Um, so we gained the products, and as I mentioned, on the client side. What has been really interesting is the infusion of talent, right? So just getting an outside, where Franklin tends to have very long tenured employees, uh, and so getting some infusion of outside talent, I think, and bringing the two firms together has been really great in a time with an industry that is changing so quickly that you have to make sure that you're continuing to feed yourself in how you're thinking. You're constantly, and I, and I worry because I think right now I say to people, I'm less worried about our, my competitors and I'm way more worried about the startup that's coming along in a fintech or honestly venture capital, private equity. I think they're being very aggressive in trying to move into traditional asset management. So you're bringing in talent and then the key is in this business, there's gonna be massive investments in technology AI, data, data is really, really expensive. To be an active manager, you have to be exceptional at being able to understand uh, non-traditional sources of data to gain insights. That's expensive to do. Um, collaboration amongst our investment teams, we think that's a strategic advantage. So we just had, um, when, uh, here, example, when COVID hit, we, you may recall that U.S. Treasuries, the most liquid asset class in the world, froze up for a day. We were able to pull together the uh, CEO of, of Western Asset, who's talking to Treasury Department, because he's so wired in there, um, Benefit Street, our private credit, our three macro managers, our global fixed income on Franklin, and get them in there and talking about what they're actually seeing in the different uh, tiers of credit. And to prove the point as to whether it was valuable, about six weeks later, we were doing the call initially daily and then it became weekly. I said, look, at, I, don't, I, I hate doing calls just for the sake of a call. Why don't we turn this into a uh, event-driven call? And the head of Western said, you know what? This is incredibly valuable to me. I'd like to keep it up for a while. Mm. You know, same thing, Russia and Ukraine. We're able to pull in um, experts from across our groups to understand from a commodities, from a technology. You know, the, the neon gases and the gases in, um, you know, how do they affect the chips, chip makings? Not something a lot of people talk about. Nickel, how does it affect batteries? Not just oil, gas, wheat, and corn, right? There's a lot of other factors in there. And being able to get experts from various teams coming together, opening it up for our investment teams to hear about, to submit questions, I think is a real advantage. I don't think there's any other firm that has the ability to pull that kind of fundamental capability together. Um, I know that you are passionate about innovation, technological innovation. You've mentioned it, you've alluded to it a couple times, and I want to talk more about that, especially since you also said something I thought was interesting, which is that people who go to Franklin tend to stay at Franklin for a long time. So if you are looking at technological innovation, where are you getting that from? Are you acquiring? Are you hiring people to come up with new ideas? And then whether you're talking about tokenization, slash blockchain, digital wealth, AI. How is that being integrated into the business? So I think a couple things. We, so fortunately, we're headquartered in the heart of Silicon Valley. So we actually have a great location for that. We, about five years ago, opened up an incubator. Um, we've done uh, digital wallets. I hate crypto, crypto wallets, so digital wallets. Um, we have, you know, farm, fractionalized farming in there that's been technologically driven. Um, all of them are companies that we think can be disruptive for asset management or financial services because we want to stay in the forefront of that. That kind of led us uh, to opening a venture capital fund as well as we, we've um, had, you know, kind of the first mutual fund approved uh, a, uh, it, with um, a blockchain mutual fund. So, uh, you know, think about I can't say st stable coin because that's in the crypto world. Ours is a regulated mutual fund, but it's on the blockchain. Um, and that led us into managing nodes for people, led us into uh, launching our own venture fund. You have to stay on top of, and if you tell people you're going to invest, they'll come to you. Now, we worry about the ability to keep up in the case of blockchain. And so we've launched with four universities contests, uh, two in the US, two in Poland, where we're basically saying to college students, hey, 
you want to you know, launch a company in blockchain? We're going to have a, a contest. We're going to fund the winner. And oh, by the way, we suddenly get skilled people to do programming in blockchain. So I, my goal as CEO is to spend 30% of my time focused on disruption to the industry. And to be clear, you don't hate crypto. You hate the word crypto. Is that what you're saying? I hate the word crypto. I'm a, I'm a big fan. I actually think that people underestimate. So the prior speaker, uh, every conversation. You should have seen her backstage, by the way, you guys, uh, while Matt and Dave were talking. She was, <laughs> she was talking at the screen. She had a few, she yeah. had a few thoughts. Well, on because here's why. Every, every uh, conversation about digital assets goes down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is like a piece of art. You and I agree it's worth X, it's worth X. And I went from, yeah, but any day it can be worth zero. But talk to somebody who, who uh, you know, lives in Israel, whose money was taken by the government, and you'll hear them why they want to leave some amount, uh, you know, invest in, in, in Bitcoin. You talk to, I was in the Middle East uh, soon after the, the war in, you know, Putin launched his war. And honestly, they were incensed by the fact that the U.S. would take Russian reserve dollars. So you're going to start to see countries saying, you know what? Not sure this dollar thing, it could become political. I got to park it somewhere. So I do think there's something there. However, Bitcoin is the biggest distraction from the greatest disruption that is happening to, to financial services. And I'm just going to leave you with two thoughts and why you should care about it. It is going to disrupt how money is raised and invested in equities. So Web 1.0 was, think about it as, as read it. I pre it was like a billboard, remember? You put up your website, for those old like me, you put up a website and you just left it there. And then Web 2.0 became write it. It came transactions, let's communicate to each other. Web 3.0 is read it, write it, and own it. Because blockchain's gonna enable, because the technology's gonna enable with smart contracts, a different level of ownership. Two examples, today, if you Google, right, you would agree that there's some economic value that you bring to Google, and they capture 100% of it. There is a very poorly executed search engine leveraging blockchain where when you use them, you get paid in their coins for, say, let's say, I don't know what it is, but let's say it's a third of the economic value, right? Suddenly you're starting to own a little piece of what you bring to it. It's the social environment of it. Another example, there's a company called Tether TV. Tether TV wants to be the fastest streaming service out there. When you watch Tether TV on your device, you are agreeing to allow them to cash. You're basically allowing their, your device to becoming part of their infrastructure. They cash the content, and then when Julie wants to watch it over here, it, boom, it goes to her. All it has to do is leap from my device to her device, and they pay you in T-Fuel. Ethereum, it drives me nuts that Ethereum trades like, like Bitcoin, and I thought his explanation of risk assets was a good one, but Ethereum is like when Steve Jobs came out with the iPhone. Right? What we all thought was, hey, this is pretty cool. I've got a phone, I've got you know, GPS, I have flashlight, I have music. Wow, this is great. What he understood what he, that what Apple was doing was they were unlocking the imagination of the people and providing a platform to do it. That is what Bitcoin, or that is what blockchain is doing. And so when we talk about tokenizing alternatives, or we talk about uh, you know, bringing, democratizing alternatives, a phenomenal way to do that is leveraging blockchain. Because imagine if I owned the Empire State Building. I can sell it to a million people. Today, if I did that, each one would have to get sign off from everybody else because that would be in the rules. And I'd have to go to a title company, right? But imagine if all that's encoded in the smart contract and the token. So Jenny, what's your, what, do you, what does Franklin do? How do you get a piece of that? What do you... Well, so one is I really want to understand it, but here's what we're doing. So we have, we have the tokenized money market fund. We're a node validator. So you remember it's a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a distributed ledger. So you have independent nodes. Why will governments want blockchain? One, I can tax you because I know who you are. And two, it's better from cybersecurity because while I run my node, there might be 19 other people who run the node all with an independent cyber environment. So if Russia wants to come in and breach mine, they have to figure out who the 19 are and what their architecture is, which makes it much difficult to do. So we run, and by the way, you get paid to run nodes. So we run nodes. Uh, we have some strategies that we have seeded. We think it, eventually when this becomes regulated that your clients will want to have some allocation to it. So we want to have um, ability to have a, a, a well-managed active crypto portfolio. Um, we buy loans that are generated on the blockchain, so we're doing a few different, and we have a venture capital fund. 
There was lots more I wanted to get to, which we're not going to have time to, but I do want to ask one provocative question that came up on the screen in our last two minutes. Somebody asked if mutual funds are eventually going to go away to be replaced by ETFs. So I think that um, there will be a place for mutual funds, but they will not. And, and, and why do I say that? Look, at there, there's no question that the tax inefficiency of mutual funds exists versus an ETF. But the reality is on the active side, I'm pretty sure transparent active is what has won. There are certain strategies where transparency could hurt. If you're running a, smart, a small cap fund, you can't tell the world where you're, as you're building a position, there's just not enough there to do. So there will be certain strategies where it'll be better to have it in a mutual fund, but it'll certainly, I think, honestly, SMA, separately managed accounts, direct indexing, all of those become um, a bigger part of the solution. ETFs and mutual funds will just shrink, but I don't think they go away. All right, Jenny Johnson, CEO of Franklin Templeton. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Jenny.